Welcome back to It's Only Money with financial advisors Scott Brown and Tammy are here. They are with Edgewater Family Wealth. EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com is the website. I'll get that question a lot. People ask me how to get a hold of Scott. That's the website. EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com. And we are doing it here uh, on another weekend, fellas. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. And I need to point out, Ryan, real quick, that this is our first show on 96.9 The Game. Yes, welcome 96.9 The Game. All you sports fans, you like winning? You want to win financially? EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com. Uh, better record than the Magic, I can say that, that about. Is, uh, that's uh, sadly true. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, I've been thinking about you all week, man. Uh because I know I make fun of you a lot, uh, but I, I recommend you highly to a lot of people. And but Wait, you make fun of me and then recommend me, or in that order? Well, because of this, Scott, because you have I, people are like, well, how do I find out more about Scott? I was like, we go to Edgewater Family Wealth. And I'm like, he also has a book because <laughs> he wrote a book. He's, yep. a, he's a book writing man, he's a published author. Uh, the T.S. Eliot of Financial that World. That is so true. And the, uh, the thing is, is your book title though? I, mm-hmm. I'll tell people I'm like, yeah, you got to you got to check it out. And they're like, oh, what's this book called? It's called, it's called, mm-hmm. I never made anybody rich. Yeah, which is uh, it, it, why it, do you roll your eyes when you say that? Because it's a, I don't know if you picked the right book title. <laughs> it's not very clickbaity. No. Uh, it's what, whatever the opposite of clickbait so is. It's that this. marketing is not my thing apparently. And I, and I was like, okay, I I want to check it out. And, and this is true. Uh, so you can get the book. You can go to Amazon and you can get the book. I'm sure a lot of different places you can go. Uh, and, and if you have a Kindle uh, Unlimited account, you can get it for zero dollars. Again, I don't know if it's the best financial no, plan. No, it's uh, no wonder I'm not getting rich. <laughs> now, I will I will be honest. I have not completed your whole book. Uh, you gave me a copy, and mm-hmm. I've, I've I've skimmed through. Yeah, uh, you're a skimmer. But you have reviews for your book. Mm-hmm. First of all, let's yeah. talk about that. My mom is very active. No, you no, you <laughs> well, you have five star reviews. There's 22 reviews for your book. This mm-hmm. one is my favorite one. Yeah, this is from a man named Don. Yes, yeah, so I know exactly who Don is. It's a verified purchase, and yeah. the, the review of your book is this. Wizards, mm-hmm. vampires, yes. love, yes. murder. Yes. It's all in there. Yeah. You just got to read between the lines. <laughs> this- yeah. You know, you know, we all have that one brother in law. Mm-hmm. That's him. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I don't remember seeing any wizards. Or no, murder. I don't recall. I think he read Harry Potter and got confused. Okay, because I was about halfway through your book, and I'm like, and I'm looking at this. I'm like, does it have a twist? There is no point? wizards in here. <laughs> there are none. But your book, I do got to say, again, I've never made anyone rich. Yeah. Uh, sticking with that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going with it. It's probably going to stick with me forever. In 36 years, I've never made anybody rich. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I uh, the the. Believe it or not, like any industry, I suppose, it's a tight-knit community in Central Florida, financial advisors, especially the really big and successful ones. Um, And I know a lot of the big players in town, a lot of really successful, thoughtful, brilliant, uh, well-intended financial advisors in this town at various firms. Doesn't matter what firm they're at, they're still good people. Um, And I can promise you not a single one of them has ever made anyone rich, at least over the short term. And what I mean by that is if you're rich and you're listening to this right now, I'm comfortable that I did not make you rich. And I'm also comfortable your existing financial advisor did not make you rich. Because, frankly, that's not our job. And it, even if it was our job, we wouldn't have a job for very long. Because buying a stock, uh, and again, I've been doing this a long, long time and have lots of clients and lots of friends in the business. And I don't know a single person who said, hey... I had this client come in the other day, and they had $1,000. And I said, let me have that $1,000, and I'm going to buy the stock, XYZ company. And then three weeks later, they had $2 million, Scott. <laughs> I've never heard that story because that story doesn't exist. Mm. You know, it's, it's funny to me that, you know, my industry, unfortunately, believes that they have to kind of insinuate. They don't say it. But they insinuate in commercials and marketing. It's just a vibe. And if you come with our firm, Tammy, if you come with our firm, I'll consider you're them. going to make a lot of money. Don't go to the other firm because those guys are idiots. The guys in the building next door. Yeah, just those as guys big are of a sign, just as nice windows. Yeah. yeah. And don't forget that a lot of the guys that work in the other building used to work in this building and vice versa. <laughs> but let's not talk about that part, right? That they are switching cubbies on a fairly regular basis between those large companies, right? So, no, I, I, I will continue. To, in fact, I'm 
contemplating a second book, which is I still haven't made anybody rich, uh, which is the sequel to I've Never Made Anyone Rich. Part two. Uh, yeah, starring, check, out, check out part three. Yeah. No, still not yet. <laughs> starring Matthew McConaughey in the sequel. But no, I have, I have never made anyone rich. What I have done for 36 years is guide people who have been fortunate enough or diligent enough or responsible enough to accumulate wealth and help them make decisions so that they don't give it back. There's this idea out there uh, perpetuated by, I think, my industry to some degree uh, and sometimes not dissuaded by people in my industry that we're here to make you rich, and the reality is that that is not the case. I'm going to continue to tell people uh, that what you're looking for is hard work. You're looking for honesty. You're looking for, hey, how do I save a little bit in taxes? What's a good, which account do I take this money from? I have this administrative problem. The government tells me I have to take a required minimum distribution. Where should I take that from? I have a Roth. I have a 401k. I have an IRA. I have some cash I inherited. Should I buy tax-free bonds? Should I buy taxable bonds? How long should I go on the curve? Uh, can you fill out this stupid paperwork for the 18th time for me? Where did that dividend go? And I could go on all day on the things that we do on a daily basis. I once made my assistant keep a list, uh, my assistant, my wonderful assistant of 26 years, uh, Linda, and I said, well, I want you to write down everything you do in a week. There were 350 things on that list at the end of the week, but you know uh, what wasn't on the list? Making people rich. Yeah. 349, 350 was actually writing this list. Yes. Yeah. That was the 350th. <laughs> now leave me alone, she said. But the reality is that the industry, you know, you see ads for the the uh, discount trading houses, $5 trades, $8 trades, $9 trades, whatever, as if the cost of the trade is really going to make the difference, right? What's going to make a difference is that you saved, uh, that you were responsible, um, that you were diligent, and you had a plan that you stuck to. Whether you paid $9, $7, or $6, or $50 for a trade is not going to change your life. It's that you save. Because... The other thing that irritates me is that there is the belief that there are shortcuts. That's how we end up with meme stocks. That's how we end up with crypto problems. Uh, by the way, that crypto guy, what's that guy's name? Oh, man, for FTX? Yeah. FTX guy. What's that guy's name? We don't know that guy's name? I only knew his initials but for a long time. Here, here's the thing. Am I wrong, or is that guy like a character out of a Tim Burton movie? Uh, SBF, <laughs> uh, Sam Bankman Free. Is he a yes. character out of a Tim Burton movie or not? Yes, he looks like <clears throat> Edward Regular Hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, no scissors, but same haircut, and yeah. all he does is instead of shaving your plants, he shaves your wallet down. Yes, yes, he makes your wealth go away quickly. <laughs> yes. And he doesn't even give you a nice like uh, caricature or some kind of hedge trimming to, to no. go with it. What are those uh, things called when you trim hedges and make them into animals? What is that called? Uh, hedge animal trimming? Yeah, good enough. All right. That's <laughs> close enough. <laughs> Oddly enough, works with hedge funds, though, yeah. Edward Regular Hands. Oh, yeah. hey, oh, here comes the dad man. jokes. <laughs> so, yes, the answer to your question is I'm going to continue to say that I don't make people rich. And oddly enough, there are enough people in Central Florida and throughout the country that uh, like the idea that I'm honest about that. Um, you know, I, I, uh, first 10 years of my career, I wasn't sure that was true. You know, I was, I came into the business, you know, like any, any, any young man, I think who, uh, was alive in the, in the mid eighties and kind of came of age in the mid eighties. I was all about Charlie Sheen and wall street, baby. That's what I wanted. You know, how many yachts can you ski behind? I don't know, but I'll try. Um, <laughs> so I was all about that and I thought I could make people rich and I thought my job was to pick better stocks than the guy next to me or the gal next to me. And the reality is that's not a thing. Okay. Um, buying companies that, you know, the wealthiest people in this country did it slowly for the most part. And, and on average, people who get wealthy quickly uh, through lottery winnings and inheritances, uh, life doesn't always go so well for them. And we know sudden wealth uh, is often disappearing wealth. So uh, I believe in getting rich slowly. I believe it's the way to do it. I believe too many people look for shortcuts year after year after year if they had just taken the long way the safe way, the smart way, the diligent way, the responsible way, they would have ended up in the same place had they, one of those shortcuts worked out without near the heartburn. Yeah, and there's 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 tricky ones too. I mean, like uh, uh, you talked the last episode about someone like buying too much house, you know, because mm -hmm. like you, you think like, oh yeah, I'm, obviously I'm making an investment and I'm throwing all my money in that, mm -hmm. and then they now, but now they've bought too much house and uh, the, the market goes down and suddenly they're, you know, 40,000 less than what they started. So uh, the, the long way has a way, but they're in, even in the long way, they, there's, there's weird little secret short things that look like shortcuts that you got to be aware of as well is what I've learned from this show. 
Because yeah. I learned stuff from this. You show. do learn stuff. <laughs> I'm having that problem right now because I really, I really want a new car, and I'm, I'm, I, I, I could get a loan. <laughs> that would be a good, well, they'll give it to they'll you. They'll give me one, uh-huh. and, and it would be a really nice car. Yeah, because we know cars appreciate pretty yeah. quickly, don't they? Hey, I appreciate it, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I have to keep pulling myself back and be like sensible we gotta make sensible financial moves like scott says because he's not gonna make me rich so i gotta do it yeah 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 it's again it's not sexy it's not you can't brag about it look i'm not saying you can't buy things i'm not saying you can't have toys or cars Mm -hmm. or any of that stuff or you got to turn the cable off and eat mac and cheese all day right that's not what i'm saying uh what i am saying is just be thoughtful. It's not that hard. You know, I, I used to do 401k meetings a lot for large groups of people. I'd be in a big company, I'd be 300 people in the room. And, you know, people get all bent out of shape about which is the best fund? What are the fees? What is this? What is that? How do I get that? First of all, you got $300 in the account, man. <laughs> no. I don't care if you double it tomorrow for free. You still can't retire, right? So until you become a saver, you cannot become an investor. And there is a big difference that we can certainly talk about when we come back. All right. You're listening to It's Only Money. We'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Only Money. And you are getting just all this free info from Edgewater Family Wealth. And if you want to get a hold of these gentlemen, Scott Brown and Tammy, edgewaterfamilywealth.com is that website. And Scott, uh, we talked about your book. I don't want to criticize you too much. Mm -hmm. I I made... a little bit of fun and jabs at the na- title of the book. Yeah. But I want to make a, a, just a s- s- slight jab at you with this, is that you don't do enough mongering. No mongering. You're not a fear mongerer. I don't like mongering in general, any kind of it. I, I like a cheesemonger. Mm. Uh, Isn't there a fishmonger? There's a fishmonger yeah. as well, but like there are fear mongers. What is a monger? A monger is someone that they have it. They they they, they like If you're a cheesemonger, you got the cheese. You, you, you want to monger it out to people. <laughs> And people would, when I watch other financial shows, obviously uh, this is the one I pay attention to the most, but I, I do watch some other ones. And there's a lot, a lot of mongering. Mongering. A lot of mongering. You don't do a lot of mongering. I should take some mongering classes. I like the word monger. Because, well, I do like the word. We, we've done this show now uh, for, for a while, and over the last few months, you've not once told me that a recession is coming, mm-hmm. and it's coming down hard and fast, mm-hmm. and uh, wh- why? Why are you not letting me know? You should buy um, bullets and corn seed. Is that... You know, yeah, you, you need want- a, you need a bone broth. That's what you uh, need, Scott. Good you got to sell a broth. bone broth and yeah. uh, all stuff on the side. The mongerer's broth. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, you're, you're a broth monger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of broth. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, if, depending on where I look, this is the, this is the confusing part because I get my sources from a lot of different places. Some mm-hmm. people, some people say we're already in a recession. Mm-hmm. Some people say it's coming. Some mm-hmm. people say it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Don't e- don't even think about it. Wh- yeah. Where where are we from the, from the big brains on the other side of the glass? Well, here? you know what you need. The first thing you need. To to recognize that those are you know people who get paid to talk mm-hmm. generally will yes so keep that in mind when you're listening to the pundits on the various networks in their three thousand dollar suits they get paid to come up with something yeah, if it don't get- scare you you ain't paying attention mm-hmm. yeah that's our whole news industry mm-hmm. be terrified of this news at 11 you know so yeah. again um i you know i don't talk about recession because it doesn't matter to me i don't doesn't matter i don't care you're the money i don't care what do you mean? What you am I going to do about it? You know, I just have to deal with the cards that are played, right? You tell me the game, and I will play it, right? Recession is, I mean, it's a its a boogeyman. It's its not under your bed. It's just a two, two quarters of negative GDP technically is a recession. So if the economy drops for two consecutive quarters and it's negative GDP, that is a recession. Who cares? We have one every three, four, five years, right, Tammy? All the time. It's yeah. part of the cycle. It's part of the cycle. Without the dips, we don't get the gains. This is something that I, I try to drill home with people. Well, it's volatile. The thing that you want me to do is volatile. It goes up and it goes down. Yes, that's why you get the return, because things that don't go up and down don't have much return, mm-hmm. right? You know, uh, for the last 20 years, you would have gotten less than 1% on a CD. You know what doesn't go up or down? A CD, <laughs> right? But the market has earned considerably more than that over that time. Why? Because there's risk in it. Risk markets exist for the return. If if there was no potential return over an extended period of time in risk markets, they would not exist, right? We After a while, we go, we just always lose money. This is the 17th year in a row the S&P has been down. Maybe we should stop doing this, right? 
That's not a thing, <laughs> right? The S&P goes down every three or four years like it did last year. But on average, we know it's paid us somewhere. If we held in there with the Dow or the S&P, we probably made 6 7 8% depending on the time frame, mm -hmm. right? Well, you don't get 8% in a fixed instrument unless it's, you know, 1979 and inflation's running at 13%, in which case you're still losing, right? So if you want return, you must take risk. People who are wealthy like Warren Buffett or Bill Gates or uh, previously Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, these people that we, we idolize, some people do, I don't, but some people do, and we say, look how rich they got. And then we say, well, why don't you invest a little and, you know, well, it might go down. Well, I mean, really? Elon Musk was like within minutes of being completely bankrupt with Tesla. He was flying, borrowing money from people to fly Southwest to his next meeting. And that's when he went through, because he went through all his PayPal money, right? So mm -hmm. you have to understand to make gains, outsized gains, you must take some risk. You don't have to be stupid about it. You don't have to be silly about it. You can be thoughtful. You can be diligent. You can buy boring stocks. You can buy Coke. You can buy Microsoft. You can buy IBM. You can buy Apple. Um, and I'm not this, you know, for the lawyers in the crowd, I'm not saying recommending buying these stocks. I'm just giving you an example of things that you might not think are sexy because, Hey, you know, at the cocktail party, hey man, I bought I bought Dogecoin or I bought crypto whatever. I don't even know half the names cuz there's thousands of them. They come up every day yeah, too. Yeah, and they're and the guy, "Oh, that's cool. Hey, how, what did you do? I bought Microsoft. I, I got to go. I, I don't want to talk to you. You're boring. It's what you bought. Really? You know, were there no Model Ts available? What's your problem, buddy? You know, so <laughs> you know, peep, it's not a sexy story, but by golly, it wins more often than it doesn't. Yeah, it, it, it's funny too because I, I dipped my toe into the crypto for a minute, and it was like I, I just bought like Bitcoin, and then the the crypto bros were like, "Well, you, you got." It was almost like you were talking about a band, mm -hmm. and they're like, "It's like yeah, I bought Bitcoin," and then they might as well be like, "You, that's like the Nickelback of <laughs> financial service. What you what you got to get into is upside down pineapple coin, and that's where the real cool yeah, people go. That's where it's the that's the indie action right there." <laughs> Yeah. So, so recession again, like it's it's a it's a feature, not a bug of our financial it is system. Dead. Well exactly, said. Yeah. You couldn't say it any better than that. It is a feature, not a bug. Without the feature, the machine doesn't work. You know. But it, it, and what I thought this as I was watching uh, news while we were uh, on break, but like Elon Musk has now set the you know the world record for most money lost by a person bingo yeah he, i mean he lost 200 billion dollar billion that's a b yeah that's Bil a b billion dollars yeah and and my question is like like when i have 25 bucks right 25 bucks is real like i can i can buy a, 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 a at least three bananas and some eggs at the grocery store with that right uh with our current situation but like w when does money not become real and it's just a uh it's fully just a a, a thought and and move because two hundred billion dollars. It's not like someone took a briefcase, well, several a tanker of money and and moved it away. Yeah. So how do you how do you explain that to a common person who sees that doesn't really understand yeah. money? Well, I mean, it's not again to your point. You didn't have a tanker full of dollar bills that somebody just came and took. You know, hooked a tow truck to and pulled away. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's. You know he was he was worth those other hundred two hundred billion dollars on paper. So he owned he owns a bunch of the stock. Right. So the stock has dropped. A lot in price because he's got himself into a little bit of a pickle with his Twitter situation. Um, he's had to sell a bunch of stock. The price has dropped. People are losing a little bit of confidence in Elon Musk. I mean, I'm a huge, I was a huge Elon fan. I read his biography the second it came out. I loved what he's doing with space. I still do love what he's doing with SpaceX. Um, huge Tesla fan early on. Um, but people and myself, I would include myself in this category, are a little fed up with the silliness. Mm -hmm. And I, we believe, uh, as Scott Galloway has famously said, if you tell a guy he's Jesus Christ long enough, he's eventually going to believe you. And he seems to be at that point. So we need somebody needs to reel him back in. Uh, but back to the, the question at hand, which is, is that real? Of course it's real. I mean, he had that was the value of the stock. And if the stock was 500 bucks, and now it's 100 and whatever it is, what is it now? Uh, 118. 118. All that value was wiped out. But eight months from now, 10 months from now, three years from now, seven years, I don't know when, there's a very good chance it'll all come back. He doesn't care. He wasn't going to spend $500 billion at the store tomorrow, right? Yeah. Um, so it is a different situation. In a way, it is kind of funny money, money that he's likely, he in fact, couldn't spend if he wanted to. 
right? It's business money. It's it's money he'll use for other enterprises to do his little Twitter thing. Who knows if that'll work or not? I'm not saying it won't. At this moment, it's definitely not. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's it, it's the reason that the average person, myself included, can't really get their heads around it is because we can't even fathom that kind of money. Yeah, it's uh, it, you're, you're absolutely right. Like if somebody... Elon Musk started scrappy, you know, like, and, 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 he, and he wasn't told, like, everything he does is amazing. I watched that transition happen. I was a, I was a bit of a muskrat myself for a little while. Mm-hmm. That's what we call ourselves, mm-hmm. the fans of Elon <laughs> Musk. Uh, and you, you could see that shift. And honestly, if if there was a, a company and, the, and they, A, there's just a bunch of people making fun of me on a platform or telling me I can't say something, and I could take half of my income yep. and just buy that, yep. I would do it just to be spiteful as well, though. You know what I mean? So there's, there's stuff that makes sense emotionally. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's where he's at. I mean, I think he's a little impulsive and... Um, I think for the first time in his life, he's probably gotten out over his skis. So I, I get it. I get where he's coming from, and I get the frustration. And I get part of it is, I, I, I venture to say, political. There's there's some appeal he's trying to get from a certain group of people, and uh, he thinks this will get him there to some degree. Um, but at the end of the day, he needs to get back to blocking and tackling and running what, uh, at least at one point, was maybe the greatest com- company ever created mm-hmm. uh, and is certainly less than that today. And that, that's a problem, you see, with the emotional impulsiveness. We cannot factor that in in any of our risk management, if you call it, in the mm. financial world. Yeah. Because we do the math, we do what we want, but that we cannot factor in. That's so interesting that part of your job is factoring in the zaniness of the people running the companies <laughs> and whether they will just go uh, go absolutely off the walls bonkers at any point. So, uh, But if you want to work with Scott, who is not off the walls bonkers, or Tammy, who is the numbers man, who pulled that Tesla number just out of his, out of his head right there. Out of there. his that, what? That, <laughs> <laughs> just real fast. That was impressive. Uh, call Edgewater Family Wealth. You can get that number by going to edgewaterfamilywealth.com, and we'll be right back with more it's only money welcome back to it's only money i'm here with financial advisors from edgewater family wealth scott brown and tammy i'm ryan from the monsters in the morning and if you want to get a hold of those gentlemen go to edgewaterfamilywealth.com they got the phone number they get the blogs they got financial talks with tammy and they've got uh, links to past episodes all that kind of stuff as well um and during the break i was thinking because you're you got you're you're not good at making people rich, or mm-hmm. or you never made you anybody stop rich. Saying that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because you well because your logic is that uh you know you come from if you're a doctor you make your money being the doctor mm-hmm. and then you're there to make the money work for you or you, whatever tradesman you are like you're there to make that money then work and move into retirement so you're not there to make people rich necessarily. Nope. But the question is this, because I imagine you work with a lot of people. Some of you say aren't always the best money with their doctor, but like when it comes to business people, Mm -hmm. what makes somebody a good businessman? Like what, or a business person rather, what, what separates, uh, you know, a good shrewd business person from a guy who, you know, he, he had a good idea. He opened up a company, maybe it closed down in, in, in two, three years. Yeah. And there's an old saying that just because you can make an apple pie doesn't mean you can run an apple pie store. And that unfortunately happens to a lot of people. They they think, oh, I'm good at this trade, or I'm I'm good at plumbing. I'm good at being an electrician. I'm good at uh, being a doctor. I'm good at being a lawyer. I'm being a good whatever. And then they say, I should run a business doing this thing that I'm good at. But the problem is, it's a completely different skill set, right? You know, the, Tammy is our money manager. Tammy does our trading. He buys our bonds. He looks at the durations. He looks at the terms. He looks at the yields. He looks at the quality. He does all the research on the firms that we buy in our stock portfolios. He does all that. And it's not that I couldn't do it, but he does it better. And so I'm running the business. I'm the advisor. I'm also running our advisory business where we employ dozens of people um, that do a variety of tasks. So my skill set is uh, originally was a financial advisor. And I will tell you, um, I don't know how to say this without sounding cocky or something, but I'm one of the few financial advisors that's actually running a business. Because most advisors are like anybody else. They show up at nine, they, you know, they do their job and they go home at four or five because they don't, they work for big firms because they don't want to pay the electric bill. They don't want to deal with staff. They don't want to deal with HR. They don't want to potentially deal with compliance and supervision and regulatory and all the things that I have to deal with as a, as a business owner and a financial advisor, right? So I have Tammy manage the money, uh, A, because I don't have time and B, because he's better at it, right? That's his specific skill set. 
Um, as a business owner, you have to have an entirely different skill set. If you own a plumbing business, the fact that you're a good plumber, you're really good at doing pipes, you're really good at making sure the water runs, you're really good to make sure the toilet goes where the toilet's supposed to go, that's great. But the odds of you being able to run a plumbing business are not that high. We know statistically that most businesses go out of business in their first two or three years, 70, 80% of them. And that's be- not because those people weren't good craftspeople or good attorneys or good lawyers or good whatever it is, donut making people, but they just weren't good at business because business requires a whole other skill set. And the people who are good at business are people who have a huge appetite for risk, who are not deterred by bad days because as a small business owner, you're going to have a lot of them who are not upset by employees not showing up or getting a cold or somebody needs to take their baby to the doctor or weird holidays that you didn't even know were holidays and nobody's at work that day (laughs) or the AC that went out in in the one building or uh, the one employee who keeps taking all the coffee home or the one employee (laughs) who is, you know, a a little (laughs) a little too fond of the other employee (laughs) kind of thing. You know, you you have to deal with all these things as a small business owner. And you oftentimes have to work many, many long hours, uh, which a lot of people just simply they'd rather. There's a lot of people. And believe me, I have my days where you'd say, hey, you know, for a lot less money, I'd love to come in at nine and leave at five. And then go home and do what I do at home and separate. A business owner never does that. A business owner never separate. They go home at five or six or eight or nine, and they just keep right on working. They're looking at their laptop. They're checking payroll. They're checking to see if the revenue is there. Do I have enough to make payroll? Oh, my God, health insurance costs. What? Um, You know, these are the things that small business owners deal with on a regular basis. So at the end of the day, a small business owner is somebody who's pretty much (laughs) borderline foolish but definitely fearless. Um, and is willing to accept a very high amount of risk, which brings me to another point because, you know, you this is what happens to small business owners too. Is they, as I said in an uh, earlier show, is people try to get rich twice. So you spent thirty years building this business, forty years building this business. You took the ultimate risk. You are the ultimate small cap stock. Your business, right? Every day is a risk. Every day somebody could sue you. Every day an employee could sue you. Every day a customer could sue you. Every day a catastrophic event could occur. You know, one of your plumbing trucks runs into a school bus full of nuns. I don't know what could happen, <laughs> but bad stuff can happen when you own a small business that isn't through no fault of your own can put you out of business. So you are the ultimate small cap stock. And if then you turn around and go to a financial advisor who says, hey, man, you've been able to run this amazing business. You've worked your fingers to the bone, uh, sacrifices by you and your spouse and your family and you've had you know, high blood pressure and stress and blah, 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 blah. And now you have $5 million to show for it. Let's see if what we can do with meme stocks. <laughs> this seems like a bad idea, right? So what I would say is the amazing – listen, our economy runs on small business. 60%, 70% of America's em- employees work for small businesses. And it's the backbone of our economy, which politicians say all the time but don't really mean because they don't really care – um, cause that ain't where the money's coming from, right? It's not like I can walk down to the local politician and say, I'm going to drop, you know, 50 million in your super PAC, right? Mm. That ain't happening. So he don't care what I have to say. Whereas a big major fortune 500 company can do that. So as small business owners, you got it all, man. You got no political clout. You got mad employees, mad customers, lots of liability. Lawyers always hunting for you. Um, So I would say that that's the ultimate endeavor. It's what makes America run um, is our small business owners and entrepreneurs, and we need to reward them for that, not beat on them for that. Um, But the other side of that is when you do finally cash in the chips or you do finally step away, literally step away from that thought process and invest your money thoughtfully, not stupidly. I always find it fascinating when somebody has a a successful business and then uh, they go to start another business, mm-hmm. and then that business fails. Yeah, it's well because it's a sickness. <laughs> I mean, I have it. I believe mm-hmm. me. I'm an entrepreneur through and through, and I I've never seen an idea I didn't like. <laughs> Luckily, I have people around me to keep me from doing stupid mm-hmm. things. Right? I am a very I'm a reasonably successful person as a business owner and as a financial advisor. Uh, but I've thrown money at a few ideas that because I thought, oh, I can take the magic over here. Yeah and realize that I can't do that person's job too and run their business and mine, just did it kind of passively, 
even though I'm like watching with total consternation. Oh, why are they doing that <laughs> with my money? You know, um, and you know, again, it was it wasn't like it bankrupted me. It was always money that I. Th- kind of would take a flyer on with some small business owner that wanted me to help them fund something. Um, but, but by and large, yeah, sometimes you got to just stay in your lane and do what you know. And if you, you know, I, I, I can tell you all kinds, I've had doctors come to me. I invested in a trucking company. You're an obstetrician. Why are you <laughs> running a trucking company? <laughs> well, babies and trucks, they go together. You know that, don't you? You know, so, uh, uh, you know, just, I would argue that, you know, Stop trying to get rich twice. Um, if you like what you're doing and you're good at it, either keep doing it or retire from it and do something more fun. But this this taking a second crack at it, oftentimes, like you said, doesn't work out the way people want. It's funny he's a like doctor and going into the drugging business, but like I remember like looking at like who owned Subway and the name of that company, and it's like is it's like physicians international or something it's like <laughs> could be. it's some like group of doctors that own it and then and then like the bar that i would go to at ucf was uh it's called it's called nice library yeah and it was owned by like dentists mm. <laughs> you know, like, so uh doctors uh, did, did they do a good job i don't know but well, uh, i mean some of them are i mean <laughs> we shouldn't say you know i don't want to paint everybody with the same brush there's lots of physicians who are very astute um but it ain't most of them when it comes yeah. to investing and you know I just don't want to be getting surgery and then be like are you, did you did I see you working at the sandwich shop <laughs> being the manager the other day you want mayo with that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's well I mean think of all the athletes I mean you you know if you're a substantial athlete like you're a first round pick in uh, any of the four big ones you know you you got to have a restaurant I mean, what are you doing? You got that's the first thing you got to do is open a restaurant because yeah. you're 23 years old and you're really fast and you're, you know, you're you're a good receiver. It's so naturally you would run a restaurant. Of course. You're good at running, why yeah. not why run not a, a restaurant? restaurant? <laughs> yes, yes. So it's because some idiot gets in their ear and says, "Hey man, how about we open a restaurant? It'll be super cool. We'll put your picture up." There'll be your trading cards will be on the wall. Mm-hmm. Uh, there'll be women everywhere. There'll be this. There'll be that. Everybody will love you. We'll put statues up. We'll sell champagne. I mean, I'll give it away. But, you know, when you're not looking, you know, I'll give it away. But when you're looking, I'll sell it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, this this goes on. I mean, I, I can think of three athletes that I knew personally that did this before I got to them. Yeah, I know well, one guy who had a, at a restaurant, and he, he didn't even eat the food in his own restaurant. And I yeah. was like, I think this is a bit of a tell here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, you, do what you, you do what you do. And if you're doing what you're doing, and you're like, hey, I'm thinking about my future, and I don't want to be working my hands to the bone in, well into my 80s, you want to talk to Scott Brown. And Edgewater Family Wealth. That's right. Go to edgewaterfamilywealth.com. Check out the blogs. Check out the past episodes. All that information free. Oh, man. Plus, if you have Kindle Unlimited subscription, you get Scott's book free. I don't know how this man makes money. Would you stop giving my book away? He's, <laughs> I think your book should be called I've Never Made Myself Rich. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but we'll be right back with more It's Only Money. Welcome back to It's Only Money, and I'm here with financial advisors Scott Brown and Tammy from Edgewater Family Wealth. That's where you want to go for all your financial needs is edgewaterfamilywealth.com, and I wish I would have done it uh, a lot sooner because here, here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, we have this big thing with FTX where the crypto collapse, NFTs, uh, basically no one's talking about those anymore, Mm-mm. but at the time... It was exciting. I mean, like it would look like that, like a lot of money could be made, even for somebody like me. You know, like I, I could, I could get in. But it turns out uh, that's not so good. There's been other things in my life. Like I got, I sort of got lucky because of the financial collapse. Like I, I was still early enough to where like I could ruin my life, and that's fine. I could recover. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but those are the ones that I know about. And I'm curious because you've been doing, uh, you've been doing this, Scott, for how long? Thirty six years. Thirty six years. What what were some of the older like the the older not I can't call crypto a scam but uh, the things that are like too good to be true or like a Ponzi scheme and and how as a regular person do I stop you know how do I see it coming I guess well I mean again as Tammy just said it you know at the break if it's too good to be sounds too good to be true it more than likely is um, you know again it's it's all about shortcuts people want shortcuts they want to believe it, whether it's a financial advisor an accountant a lawyer their neighbor their plumber or their sister-in-law whatever it is people want to believe somebody's gonna whisper in their ear and say hey 
this is the thing. I know you've been struggling financially. I know you only got, you know, 200 bucks to your name and the bills are due and the kids are screaming and the grocery store is expensive. So what I want you to do is take this 200 bucks and do this thing. Um, and then all your problems will be solved. But the problem with that is it just creates more problems. There's been zillions of those from tulips uh, to Ponzi himself to Madoff. Uh, there's a, there was a group called Long-Term Capital Management in the 90s. Um, you know, it's interesting because we, we, we hope, well, these are smart people. These smart people can help us. These smart people are going to – and the, other, the funny thing about smart people is if you say, well, that's a smart person. And I think they can help me with my money. And yet they seem to be coming to work with you every day and still driving the same 74 Pinto that they've been coming and still living with mom in the basement. I know exactly what you mean because the kid that works the kettle corn stand uh, for me, he would come at me with all these like hot tips. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're cooking my kettle corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a simple rule in life. <laughs> don't take financial advice from people who are poorer than you, and don't take health advice from people who are out of shape, right? Mm. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's just simple. Um, so, yeah, this long-term capital management company was founded by two Nobel Prize winners. So then you say to yourself, well, these smart people uh, who don't seem to be any really wealthier than I am, but they're smart, and I know they're smart because they told me so. Yeah, they, they won the prize. Right, they got that prize. So it's literally there. the smart prize. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, you know, that's what it's all about. So, with that understood, in the 90s, these two Nobel Prize winners founded this firm. Uh, they took in a billion dollars. They were trading bonds. They were doing swaps. They were using derivatives, all kinds of words that nobody understands. And it turns out neither did they, because long-term capital lost billions of dollars. In fact, I think around $4 billion at the time, which was easily the equivalent of two or three times that now. And guess what happened, Ryan? They were capitalists. And they were doing capitalist stuff, and they were going to get capitalists rich. Hell yeah, America. America. And then guess what happened? They ran out of money, and guess what they became? Socialists, because they <laughs> wanted the government to bail them out. Right? So, again, you know, keep it. This is not me picking. Okay, I'm a capitalist. I love me some capitalism, so don't get mm -hmm. wrong. Don't, don't write or don't call and don't email me. Uh, I love capitalism, and I love America. But. These two clowns uh, lost a lot of money for a lot of people, and you, you know, then you think to yourself, well, if two dudes with a Nobel Prize in economics don't know the secrets, then maybe you ought to say to yourself, there ain't no secrets, Ryan. Mm. Yeah, that's scary then, because, <laughs> because it, it does seem like sometimes like these, like a uh, you, we talked about before, like how the, the people at the top firms have been off by as much as like 14%, you mm -hmm. know, and-, and yep. Is it is it an when you're successful at this? Is it one of those like enough monkeys with enough typewriters will write Shakespeare situation? That is a hundred percent true. And you know it's a broken clock theory, right? There was there have been numerous examples I could give you. I won't name names because I'll get in trouble. But there there was a um, there was a gal, and I don't remember her name, so I can't name her. But this is about ten fifteen years ago, and she predicted the collapse of uh, temporary collapse of the muni market. Um, and she went on to repredict things like that for the next 20 years. She got the first one right, so people kept listening to her. Mm. She was never right. I mean, there's a couple, There's a Bond guy that I won't name either because my, my uh, people will get mad at me. But he's constantly predicting the end of the world and that you should buy bonds. You know why? Because he's a bond manager. <laughs> um, right. No iron in that fire. So um, the reality is, you know, nobody, you know, People like Jim Cramer and people who are on CNBC or Fox Money or whatever your flavor is, they're just, they get paid to talk, so they do. They don't have to be right. They just have to sound smart, use acronyms, let's say a lot of big words you don't understand. And you go, that dude's smart. Did you make any money from his recommendation? No, but he's smart. <laughs> right? So, again, you know, just be wary of the naked man offering you his shirt. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, I, when you said you bailed him out, I'm like, I, I honestly was like, the 2008 is the first time we did that. Uh, nope. Turns out, oh no, no, <laughs> the SNL crisis was the same, right? The SNL savings and loan industry did the exact same thing. Well, let's make money. You know, this tree's going to grow to the sky. We're capitalists. Let's go, baby. You know, uh, light the rockets. You know, let's take off. And then things didn't go so well, and they went, oh, can we have some money, please, from the government? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it is what it is. So you got you to gotta be wary. But, like, it's it's funny because I do this show, and I'm like, oh, honestly, I, I get, I'm I through osmosis. I'm becoming richer and richer every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised to learn this, which was, like, uh, people always talk about the one percenters, you know? And I thought the one percent 
uh, of financial earners, I thought this would be like, oh, you make you know two million dollars a year, right? But according to my quick Google search. It's only five hundred and ninety-seven thousand dollars. I say only, yeah. but I mean, I, I, yeah. but that's that's a much lower number in my head than I thought it was. Yeah, and even me, I'm a I'm a twenty-three percenter according to Google, <laughs> looking it up on a yeah on like where I where yeah. I make money. Uh, and I found that to be interesting that that uh, that 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 the one percent is it, it that number? Well, I mean, yeah, and one percent's like a doctor, you know. I mean, there yeah. are plenty of doctors that make six hundred grand a year, you know, and and people want to villainize. They use, you know, they throw. It's a political term, one percenters. Somebody made it up and it's mm-hmm. stuck, and then people can remember it. So, yeah, one percenters. Who's that again? Oh, that's Doctor Jones next door. That, <laughs> that's that's my grandma. That's the guy. <laughs> that's the guy with a stethoscope that's looking at my heart right now. Mm. Um, so you know, it's it's. I'm not saying it's not a lot of money because it certainly is a wonderful money, and by world standards, it's off the charts. You know, it's it's a amazing uh but you know be careful who you villainize um you know these you know a lot of times one percenters employ 15 people you don't think about that part right people ah he's rich well you know he's got 30 families working for him you know that he's responsible for these people that come to work every day um yeah we don't think of doctors as small businesses they are yeah well they used to be less and less because the hospitals are all buying them all up there's very few independent physicians left which is believe me they're not happy about uh, but really don't have a choice in. Um, but the reality is these small business owners that we bemoan sometimes as one percenters, if we think of them that way, are really our largest employers. They're the reason um, that a lot of people can buy groceries and the reason a lot of people can support their families and put their kids through college. Now, I, you know, we don't, we, you guys don't care if there's a recession. It doesn't matter. I don't get care. It. And I know. But my, but there has to be a way for me who does care because I care about things, Scott. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm with you. I'm with you. I get what you're saying. It, you just you gotta you gotta work around it. It's gonna happen. It's part of the system. Yep. Are there all weather kind of stocks or bonds or is there something that like kind of always makes it through? Whether it's you know you might gain you might gain point one percent, but it this this thing right here bricks. I don't know. Bricks sounds like something. It would be like they're always going to need bricks. You Dirt. know? <laughs> Dirt's always good. Dirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there something like that that exists? And if and if it does. Why isn't everybody in it? Well, I mean, I think you've answered your own question. Is the, the returns are nominal. The less risk you take, the more nominal the return, right? And we, you know, you can look across the spectrum. If you look at um, CDs, for example, and I don't know what the historical rate of CDs is, but I'm going to guess it's three, four percent. Uh, the premium you get for taking risk in the stock markets three or four percent above that, right? So seven, eight percent, depending on the time frame. The S and P 500, the Dow, whatever. Don't quote me on that, but it's close. Um, there's a premium for taking the risk. So, you know, the last 20 years, a CD would have probably averaged less than two, I would guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I might be wrong about that, but it's not much more if it is more. And, and so, yeah, you could buy a CD and that'd be great. Now, you know, moving into the equity world or the stock world. Yeah. I mean, if you're buying big blue chip companies, power companies, utilities, maybe value stocks, a Procter and Gamble or, a, um, I don't know, Coke or, or John Deere or Caterpillar, or Boeing, or Lockheed, and you say, look, I, you know, I'm going to own this stock for the next 40 years. I don't really give a crap whether it goes up and down. It's going to pay me a nice 3 or 4% dividend. Ford pays a nice dividend, et cetera. I'm going to own this stock. You know, lots of, you know, the people who get wealthy outside of small business owners and, you know, inherited wealth or whatever it is, um, in stocks do it over the long haul. I have seen many clients, young people, you know, young adults, I should say, maybe people in their 30s or 40s come in, somebody's passed away, and they're like, I got this Coke or I got this Caterpillar, or I got Lockheed, or I got whatever I got, and I've got X of thousands of shares, and my grandma bought Exxon back in 1948, and uh, you know her cost basis is 10 grand. Oh, what's it worth? Oh, a million three, right? Because all all that happened there was time, right? So if you want tried and true, and you want co- if you're thinking, well, what's a stock that's going to be around 10 years from now? Well, I don't know. We need paper towels. We need toothpaste. People are still probably going to drink Cokes. Tractors are a thing. Mm. So, you know, these would be all weather long term. Not that they don't go up and down because they certainly do. But if I were buying long term blue chip stocks, those, those would be some names I'd look at. 
You never give me the secret sauce. It's yeah. never going to happen. I told you the secret <laughs> sauce doesn't taste good. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want some good tasting sauce, go to edgewaterfamilywealth.com uh, and talk to Scott and Tammy, and they will set you in the right direction. Uh, edgewaterfamilywealth.com to find all the information, including past episodes. Nine, 96.5. Uh... So close. <laughs> I was so close. So close. 96.9 The Game, listeners. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it all. And again, Edgewater Family Wealth. Why am I? Take, why can't I suddenly not speak? It's it's the it's when I have to say numbers. That's what it is. Just leave the numbers to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Mic drop. <laughs> and to everybody at 96.9 The Game, thank you for joining us. I hope you join us again. And all, everybody on Real Radio 104.1, thank you. Scott, Tamey. Have a good one. Have a good Sunday. All right. We'll see you next time with more It's Only Money. Oh, crap. I said Sunday. The game's on Saturday. Well, I guess it works either way. We can get away with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.